The Raptor engine remains a major challenge for SpaceX's Starship program to this day. If previously we often saw problems with the Raptor sea level version, now the Raptor vacuum has also encountered troubles, specifically during Starship Flight 8. So, what solution does SpaceX have to solve the Raptor vacuum problem? Let's find out on today's episode of Alpha Tech. More than a week has passed since the launch of Starship Flight 8, yet the anomaly involving Ship 34 remains a hot topic of discussion. Recently, SpaceX posted a job listing for a propulsion systems engineer responsible for designing, analyzing, and building the feedline system that supplies Raptor engines on Starship. From this, we can infer a potential flaw that may have directly contributed to the explosion of Starship V2, or, at the very least, represents a challenge SpaceX engineers are struggling to refine in the design. Regardless of the exact reason, the core issue here appears to be closely related to the RVAC engine, commonly known as the Raptor vacuum. Looking back at the Starship Flight 8 mission, we can see that the entire sequence of events leading to failure began with the rocket's Raptor engines, where the first signs of trouble came from the Raptor vacuum. Specifically, an orange glowing region was observed on one of its regenerative cooling manifolds, signaling possible damage. This could indicate overheating or a failure in the cooling system, which relies on circulating cryogenic fuel liquid methane or oxygen through the engine's nozzle and chamber walls to manage the extreme combustion temperatures. If the cooling manifold was compromised, a leak or blockage, the engine might overheat, lose thrust, and potentially fail catastrophically. To get a clearer picture of how the issue developed, we need to rewind a portion of that launch. First, at T plus 804 during Flight 8, an RVAC shut down prematurely, followed almost immediately by the three center sea level Raptors. This rapid cascade of engine failures led to an asymmetric thrust profile with the two remaining RVAC engines pushing the ship off course, resulting in a loss of attitude control and ultimately telemetry loss around T plus 930. Video evidence from the launch shows an energetic event in the aft section near the engines, corroborating the idea of a sudden destructive failure. This pattern bears some resemblance to Flight 7, where SpaceX identified a propellant leak into the attic, the unpressurized area between the liquid oxygen tank and the heat shield as the likely culprit. In that case, harmonic vibrations stressed the propulsion system, causing leaks that ignited into sustained fires, shutting down all but one engine before the ship exploded. Flight 8's failure, however, appears more abrupt, less a prolonged fire and more an immediate explosion, suggesting a potentially different failure mode, possibly centered on an RVAC engine itself rather than a systemic leak into the attic. So, could an RVAC cooling failure cause this? The regenerative cooling system on Raptor engines is critical. The RVAC variant, with its larger nozzle optimized for vacuum performance, has an extended cooling network to handle the heat load in space. If a cooling manifold developed a leak or rupture, perhaps due to manufacturing defects, material fatigue, or the vibrational stresses you mentioned, the engine could overheat, leading to a burn-through. A glowing orange spot would be a telltale sign of this. If the leak sprayed propellant into the engine bay or exhaust plume, it could ignite, causing a localized explosion. This might explain the rapid loss of multiple engines. The blast could have damaged adjacent plumbing, turbo pumps, or electronics, taking out the center raptors in a domino effect. Additionally, some others have hypothesized that resonant vibrations in the Block 2 ship's fuel lines, a new design with vacuum-insulated piping, could have amplified this issue. Unlike Flight 7, where full tanks dampen vibrations until later in the burn, Flight 8's failure occurred earlier, possibly when the tanks were less full allowing oscillations to peak and rupture a critical component like an RVAC cooling line. This aligns with the ship turning slowly as thrust dropped, followed by a catastrophic loss of control. With all the possible failure scenarios, hiring a propulsion systems engineer is a necessary step in tackling the issues with Starship 5-2. How will the company address this problem? The first major change will likely involve modifications to the fuel feed lines for the vacuum engines potentially reinforcing or redesigning the plumbing system to mitigate vibrations or fuel cavitation issues. A new operating thrust target, altering engine power levels to avoid resonance frequencies that shook things loose in Flight 7. But your initial guess, extra fire suppression, extra venting, and increased tie-down points, also has legs, just in a different context. Extra venting, additional vents to release pressure from propellant leaks, Addressing Flight 7, Flight 8's venting capacity issue. Increased tie-down points. 
not explicitly stated, but the hardware changes to fuel feed lines could imply better securing of plumbing to dampen vibrations. So, why does the Raptor vacuum have such a significant impact on Starship? The RVAC is a variant of the Raptor engine optimized for vacuum conditions. Unlike the sea level Raptors, which are designed for liftoff and atmospheric flight with smaller nozzles suited to higher ambient pressure, the RVAC features a massive, extended nozzle. This larger nozzle increases the engine's expansion ratio, roughly 80 to 1 compared to the sea level Raptors 40 to 1, allowing it to extract more thrust from the exhaust gases in the near zero pressure of space. The result is a significantly higher specific impulse, ISP, a measure of efficiency. The RVAC achieves an ISP of around 378 seconds in vacuum, compared to the sea level Raptors approximately 330 seconds at sea level and slightly higher in vacuum. For context, this efficiency rivals or exceeds that of legendary engines like the Space Shuttle main engine. Starship's upper stage typically carries six Raptor engines, three sea level Raptors, and three RVACs. The sea level Raptors provide thrust vector control with their gimballing capability and are useful during ascent, landing, or any atmospheric operations like Earth or Mars return. The RVACs, however, are the workhorses for spaceflight, delivering the bulk of the thrust needed once the ship is in orbit or beyond. After the Super Heavy booster separates, the ship relies on its six Raptors to complete orbital insertion. The RVAC's high efficiency ensures Starship can reach its target orbit, whether low Earth orbit or a higher energy trajectory, without burning excessive propellant. For missions to the Moon or Mars, the RVACs are essential for performing translunar injection or trans-Mars injection burns. These maneuvers require sustained, high-thrust burns in vacuum, where the RVACs shine. Their efficiency minimizes the propellant needed, maximizing payload capacity, a key factor in Starship's design goal of delivering 150 tons to LEO or supporting crewed interplanetary missions. In Flight 8's case, the RVACs were crucial for the planned suborbital trajectory and splashdown test. Their failure not only destroyed Ship 34, but also set back SpaceX's iterative learning process. If the issue ties back to design or manufacturing, Block 2's new piping, it underscores how vital the RVAC is to the whole system and how even small flaws can have outsized consequences. SpaceX will surely improve this quickly, right? Let's look forward to the next appearance of Starship in just a few weeks. Wrapping up the SpaceX news, we now turn to a highly significant update about one of its key competitors, ULA, which is set to carry out numerous launches this year. The ULA faced a significant challenge during the second flight of its Vulcan Centaur rocket, known as CERT-2, on October 4, 2024. Just over 30 seconds after liftoff, an alarming anomaly occurred. The nozzle of one of the two solid rocket strap-on boosters, supplied by Northrop Grumman, detached from the motor. Despite the loss of this critical component, which resulted in reduced thrust, the Vulcan Centaur demonstrated remarkable resilience, adapting to the diminished performance and successfully completing its mission. The incident, however, raised questions about the rocket's reliability as it seeks certification from the U.S. Space Force for national security missions. On March 12, 2025, ULA's president and CEO, Tori Bruno, addressed the issue in a media roundtable, attributing the failure to a manufacturing defect that has since been identified and rectified. According to Bruno, the root cause of the nozzle detachment was traced to a flaw in an internal component of the nozzle, an insulator, though he refrained from disclosing specific details, citing proprietary information. We've isolated the root cause and implemented appropriate corrective actions, he explained. These fixes were rigorously validated through a static fire test of a solid rocket motor conducted in February 2025 at a Northrop Grumman test facility in Utah. The successful test confirmed that the manufacturing issue had been resolved, paving the way for ULA to resume production of the boosters. We're back to fabricating hardware and, at least initially, screening for any signs of that root cause to ensure it doesn't recur, Bruno added. The investigation into the anomaly was unusually thorough aided by a combination of recovered hardware and manufacturing remnants. Remarkably, the nozzle and other debris that detached during the flight landed near the launch pad, allowing engineers to retrieve and analyze them. ULA also recovered both solid rocket boosters from the ocean after the mission, enabling a side-by-side -side comparison between the booster that lost its nozzle and the one that performed as expected. The defective hardware just stood out night and day, Bruno remarked. It was pretty clear that it was an outlier far outside the norm for our typical quality standards. 
Additionally, the team examined trimmings, leftover material from the production process, which provided further clues about the defect's origin. This meticulous approach underscored ULA's commitment to understanding and addressing the issue comprehensively. The findings from this investigation have been formally submitted to the Space Force as part of the Vulcan Centaur's certification process for national security missions. We've completed everything required of us, Bruno said, noting that the documentation was provided in February 2025. Historically, he explained, the certification process for launch vehicles has been relatively swift once all necessary data is submitted. However, he declined to speculate on the exact timeline for Vulcan's approval, deferring to the Space Force for an official schedule. Certification is a critical milestone for ULA, as it would enable the Vulcan Centaur to carry out high-stakes missions, such as the upcoming USSF-106 and USSF-87 launches, which are part of the Space Force's National Security Space Launch NSSL program. While awaiting certification, ULA's immediate focus is shifting to its legacy Atlas rocket. The company's next scheduled launch will involve an Atlas vehicle delivering a batch of satellites for Amazon's ambitious Project Kuiper constellation, a mega constellation aimed at providing global broadband internet. Once Vulcan is certified, ULA plans to alternate between Space Force missions and additional Kuiper launches. Bruno projected that ULA will conduct approximately 12 launches in 2025, with the workload split evenly between the Atlas and Vulcan rockets, as well as between national security and commercial payloads. He highlighted the Vulcan's enhanced capacity, noting that while an Atlas can carry 27 Kuiper satellites per launch, a Vulcan can handle up to 45, an advantage that could accelerate Amazon's deployment schedule. If certification proceeds smoothly, Vulcan launches for Kuiper could begin as early as mid-2025. During the roundtable, Bruno also responded to a March 11, 2025, Bloomberg report that cast a shadow over ULA's reputation. The report cited an annual Department of the Air Force assessment of contractor performance, which allegedly stated that ULA has performed unsatisfactorily on its NSSL contract. The assessment reportedly went so far as to suggest that the Air Force was exploring the possibility of reassigning launches originally awarded to ULA to an alternate provider widely understood to mean SpaceX, ULA's primary competitor in the launch market. Bruno dismissed the report's claims as outdated and misleading. When that was written, it was inaccurate. As we sit here today, it's been completely overtaken by events, he asserted. He pointed to two key issues mentioned in the report. Concerns over the production rate of the BE-4 engine, developed by Blue Origin for Vulcan, and the solid rocket motor anomaly, both of which, he argued, have been resolved. The BE-4 production bottlenecks have been addressed, and the solid rocket motor investigation has concluded with corrective measures in place. Typically, Bruno said, he would avoid commenting on improperly leaked documents, but he felt compelled to correct the record due to the report's timing and inaccuracies. Besides its flaws, I'm a little suspicious that this was leaked at this particular moment as I await certification, he remarked, hinting at possible competitive or political motivations behind the disclosure. Looking ahead, ULA remains optimistic about its role in the evolving space launch landscape. The Vulcan Centaur, designed as a next-generation workhorse to replace the aging Atlas and Delta rockets, represents a significant investment in innovation and reliability. With the manufacturing defect behind them and a robust launch manifest for 2025, Bruno and his team are eager to prove the rocket's worth, both to the Space Force and to commercial customers like Amazon. As the certification decision looms, the stakes are high, but ULA's leadership appears confident that their corrective actions and transparency will secure Vulcan's place in the competitive world of spaceflight. That's all for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching, and see you next time.